You know, I've always been a very avid reader. I started out as a little boy reading Hardy Boys books, and then when I became a teenager, it was John Grisham novels. And then as I became self-employed, it was a lot of business books and marketing books and personal development types of things. And then obviously as I became a Christian and then a pastor, a lot of books on faith and theology. Now, how many of you like, like to read and you like to like actually take the book and you open it up, there's like nothing like the smell of a, a fresh book, right? You, you know what I'm talking about? I was the same way as that until about five years ago or so. I actually switched over and I'm primarily re reading now in digital form. Uh, primarily on a Kindle app. And there is something that I miss about actually the, the physical feeling of a book, but part of the reason that I switched was with the Kindle app, you're able to highlight all of your notes, and then at the end, you can actually click one of the buttons and it gives you all your notes right there in one document. So, you know, before it used to be if I had a book, I'd have to go back and I'd have to like flip through every single thing to find out where I'd highlight it. With the Kindle app, you don't have to do that. Everything is right there in one thing, and you're able to see, okay, this is what really stuck out to me and you know, what I, I found interesting or, or helpful. Now, many of you are familiar with that. Did, did you know that like, Kindle had the, uh, the ability to do that, that, to highlight things digitally? What you may not know is this. Amazon, who owns Kindle, they actually track every single highlight that you do. And at the end of the year, what they present is a report that shows here is the most highlighted sentences in books over the past year. Now, one of the most highlighted sentences of all time, not just this past year or any particular year, but one of the most highlighted sentences of all times comes from The Hunger Games, the book Catching Fire. And in it, Suzanne Collins, who is the author of The Hunger Games, she writes this, sometimes things happen to people and they are not equipped to deal with them. Sometimes things happen to people, and they're not equipped to deal with them. You know, isn't that true of the past year? As you think back over the, the past year, were any of us equipped to deal with the global pandemic? No, we weren't. Parents, you weren't equipped to suddenly become a homeschool teacher. Students, you weren't equipped with, how, how do I go from being in an actual classroom with all my friends to now I've got to like try to learn online? Many of you, you weren't equipped, you weren't prepared to, how do I take my job that I've done for years and years and years and years and now I'll suddenly figure out a way to actually do it in my home on a computer? We just weren't equipped for that. There was no amount of preparation we could have had. And then you add on top of that that we've had political unrest, we've had racial unrest, social unrest, financial unrest. And after a year of all that, people are going, you know what? I just want things to get back to what? I want it to get back to, to quote unquote, normal. You know what people are really saying with that? When they say, I want things to get back to normal, what you're really saying is, I just want to have a little peace. A little bit of peace of mind, a little bit of peace of heart for a little bit. I'm tired of all the chaos that's going on. I just want to experience some peace. And so today for Easter, I want to talk about how do you have peace in the midst of all the chaos? So if you have a Bible, go ahead and turn to John chapter 20. I want to welcome those of you that are watching online with us. Right now there's a little link that's popping up there in the uh, chat for you. Actually, it's up here in the upper right hand corner called Talk Notes. You can get all the scriptures I'm going to be talking about there. Same for you guys here live in the room. Welcome to you as well. Happy Easter to you. If you have a digital phone, you can pull that out and go to exponential.church. You can get all the scriptures I'm going to be talking about. All the Talk Notes are there as well. And if you don't have any of that, all the scriptures will be on the screen behind me for those in person or on the screen there for you online as well. So again, John chapter 20, and as you're continuing to turn there, let me give you just a little bit of context of what it is that we're going to be looking at here today. The disciples had spent three and a half years with Jesus. And they had seen him do miracles. They had heard all the great teaching that he had done. And they became convinced in their minds that this guy is the long-awaited Messiah. And in their mind, the Messiah was the, going to be a political leader, a great uh, guy, a warrior, a, a military general that was going to come in and free them from all their oppressors. Because if you remember, the nation of Israel for now hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years had been in captivity to other nations. 
It was the Babylonians and the Assyrians and the Peds and the, and the, or the Medes and the Persians. I mean, it was just all these different countries that were ruling them. And then all of a sudden now it's the Roman Empire. The Romans had taken over everything. And so the disciples are going, ah, oh, man, this, this Jesus, yeah, he's going to free us from our oppressors. But then they watched in shock and horror as their leader, actually under the authority of their very own religious leaders and with the permission of the Roman government, he was arrested, he was tried, he was beaten, and then he was crucified. On that Friday when Jesus died, all their hopes and dreams seemed to vanish. They thought it's over, it's done. What we had hoped and prayed for is just simply not going to happen. Jesus wasn't who we thought he was. And so when that next Sunday then rolls around, the disciples are, are gathered together in an upper room, and they're sort of quarantined together. They're, they're sequestered together, not out of fear of a virus. No, they're in fear of their own lives because they're like, wait, if they did that to Jesus, we were his closest followers. They're probably going to kill us next. And so they're all huddled together in this room in fear. That's where we'll pick up the story. John chapter 20, verse 19, the very first part of the verse, it says that Sunday evening, meaning the Sunday after Jesus' crucifixion, that Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were what? They were afraid of the Jewish leaders. And suddenly Jesus was standing there among them, and he said, now I'm going to stop right there. These are going to be the very first words that Jesus speaks to his assembled group of disciples after his resurrection. What do you think he's going to say? What is the first words that Jesus is going to say to his disciples? Is he going to go, April Fools? <laughs> Got you guys. Man, I had you going, all the fake blood and everything. And I had like hired some guys to like stage this whole thing. April Fools, oh man, <laughs> can't believe you fell for it. You think that's what he's going to say? No. Some of you are going, maybe he was mad. Because he had taught them over three and a half years to have faith. So maybe he's going to yell at them, that, what are you guys doing here? Why are you hiding? Why don't you have faith? So you think that's what Jesus is going to say? Is he going to be mad? No. So what did Jesus say? Well, the second part of verse 19 tells us, here's what Jesus says, peace be with you. Peace be with you. The very first word that Jesus says to his assembled crowd is the word peace. And really that word to them was a reminder and it was, it was really a fulfillment of something he had given them just a couple days before at what we call the Last Supper. Well, let's look at what Jesus had said to them just a couple days prior. John 14, verse 27. Jesus says, I'm leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. Jesus says, look, the peace I'm giving you, the world can't give you that kind of peace. But yet many of you over this past year, you have tried to get your peace from the ways that the world tells you to get your peace. So what did you do in the whole time of pandemic and quarantine? You said, oh, you know how I'm going to get peace? I'm going to get peace by binge watching Netflix. Specifically, what show? Right. The Tiger King. It was the rage. Everybody was watching it. That's going to give me peace in the midst of a quarantine. And a pandemic is some, you know, gay zoo owner that may or may not be killing people. By the way, this is a true story. <laughs> this wasn't like a made-up story. This was like a true story. So that's where you thought you were going to find peace in the way that the rest of the world was trying to find peace. 
Some of you said, you know what, the way I'm going to find peace is by eating. And so you just ate your way through quarantine. Some of you, it was drugs or alcohol. That's where you were trying to find your peace. For some of you, you you tried to find your peace by getting on Facebook or Twitter and just spouting every single opinion you had about every single thing under the sun. And that made you feel better, you thought. Because, man, now it's just out there. It's off my chest. Jesus says, that's not the type of peace that you need. The peace that the world offers, that, that isn't true and lasting peace. See, Jesus gives a peace that is like no other. That's what he wants for you. He wants to give you his peace. Now, by having Jesus' peace, does that mean that you're never going to have any trouble anymore? That you're immune from all future troubles? That all your cares are just going to suddenly vanish? That all of a sudden you're going to have all the money in the world that you need that you can just buy your way out of trouble? Is that what it means to have Jesus' peace? No. No, it doesn't. But yet that's how our minds tend to think. We think if I just had some more money, if I just had more followers on Instagram, if I just had a a different job, if, if I just had a boyfriend, if I just had a girlfriend, if I just was able to get married, if we were able to just have a baby, then I would have peace. Then my life would have contentment. But you know what we've discovered over this past year? And that is that all those things can be taken away from us. Everything that we thought brought us peace can suddenly just go. And so Jesus is talking about a, a peace that's, that's beyond that. A peace that's beyond what the world can give us. So many of you are coming to the realization that, you know what, maybe I need to find my peace in something or even someone bigger than all the things that the world has to offer. Now Jesus continues on then in John 20, verses 20 to 21. We read this. After Jesus had said this, saying, peace be with you, He showed them the nail prints in his hands and the wounds in his side. When the disciples saw him, they were filled with what? They were filled with great joy. And again, Jesus said to them, peace be with you. Why is Jesus reiterating this peace to them? Why why is he saying it more than one time? It's because he's saying, look, guys, look. Look, look at, look at the nail prints here in my hand. Look at the wound in my side. I overcame death itself. And because of me, you can have peace. I am truly who I said that I am, that I am God in the flesh and I have the ability to forgive sin and I have the ability to give you eternal life forever and ever. In me, you have peace is what Jesus is saying by not only his words, but by the demonstration of his very own body to them. He overcame death. And because he overcame death, we can have peace. But you know, that peace only comes if you put your full faith and trust in him. You've got to put your faith and trust in Jesus and Jesus alone. Now, I know some of you are going, okay, Gobert, that's fine if you want to believe in Jesus, but you know, why can't we put our, our faith and trust in another religion? You know, in, in Islam or, or uh, Buddhism, or why can't I go like for a new age thing like Scientology? I'll tell you the very simple reason. Right now, we could travel over to India and we could visit the grave of Buddha. Right now, we could travel to Saudi Arabia and visit the tomb of Muhammad. And Scientology openly admits that their founder, Ron Hubbard, in 1986 died and he was cremated and his ashes were spread at sea. My point is this, each and every one of those founders of different world religions, they died and they remained dead. With Jesus, I could take you to Jerusalem right now and we could go to an empty tomb. His body is not there. And that's what we're celebrating today. That Jesus truly is God. And that God was crucified on that cross on behalf of our sin. But He didn't remain dead. Why? Because He's God. 
and he came back to life. And he wants to give us life, not just abundantly right here and right now, but life forever with him in eternity. He wants to give us peace. So that's what makes Jesus different than all the other world leaders and, 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 and the other religions. He came back to life. Nobody else has ever done that. Nobody else had even predicted that they would be able to do that. Yet Jesus said, you destroy this temple and three days later it'll come back. He was talking about his very own body. That's what he did. They killed him, and he came back. And so here's our big thought for today. You're taking notes, and it's this. That peace isn't found in the absence of trouble. Peace is found in the presence of Jesus. Say that again. Peace isn't found in the absence of trouble. Peace is found in the presence of Jesus. We need to have a personal relationship with Jesus. We need to be in His presence. And that is where true and lasting peace will come from. And the Apostle Paul talked about this at one point. And, and real quick, let me talk about him. Paul was formerly a guy by the name of Saul. And Saul hated this new thing called Christianity. Saul was actually killing Christians. He was trying to get rid of this new thing called the church. But then all of a sudden, Paul got into the presence of Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, and it transformed him. It changed us. That's what happens when you truly get in Jesus' presence. You are transformed and changed by him and by his spirit. And Saul became then what is known as you know, the great apostle Paul, probably the greatest Christian that has ever lived. And at one point, Paul says, man, when you experience Jesus' peace, it is a peace which is beyond all human comprehension, beyond all human understanding. You can't even understand what it is like to have the peace of Jesus that he offers. Isn't that what you want? Don't you want that kind of peace? Peace that frees you from the, the shame of your past? Peace that, that gives you like hope and encouragement right now in whatever current circumstances you're going through? And then peace of mind and peace of heart for the future of what's going to happen, not just here on the earth, but after you die as well. Isn't that what we want? Peace from the past, peace in the present, and peace for the future. And that's what Jesus offers. And so briefly, let's actually talk about each and every one of those. You know, the, the last time I looked, the death rate for human beings is 100%. I mean, tell me if I'm wrong, but the last I checked, that, that was the statistic that I saw, right? Everybody's going to die. Many of you heard or maybe you, you saw on, on Facebook, my family had a very sort of traumatic incident this, this uh, past week. Actually, it was Sunday a week ago. My 21-year-old niece, Taylor, who lives down in San Antonio, she was working at her job on Sunday evening, and she's at a restaurant, and she was doing something with a big commercial mixer. And she thought the machine had fully powered down, and it turned out it didn't. And so when she reached in, it actually, well, it grabbed her, basically. It, first of all, it broke her wrist. It continued to pull her in. It broke her humerus bone up here. It continued to pull her in. It broke her collarbone. It continued to pull her in, and eventually it chopped off her ear. And so she has had multiple surgeries this past week. She's going to have to have continual surgeries going into the near future. Thankfully, she's going to be okay. She's, she's going to live. But the reason I tell you that story is last Sunday morning, if you would have told this, this young girl, 21-year-old girl who thinks that she has the whole world and, and whole life ahead of her, if you would have told her that today you may almost die, she would have thought you were crazy because none of us thinks that today is the day we're going to die. None of us wants to think that death is near to us at all moments and at all times and that some freak accident could happen like that. And so we've got to think about death. And we've got to think about what is going to give me peace in the moment of death? How am I going to answer for my sinfulness? What am I going to do in that moment? Who's going to give me peace for all that? 
when I have to stand before God and give an account for my sins. Now, I'm going to return to this in just a little bit, but let me just say to you right now, only Jesus can give you real peace in that moment. But I understand that for many of you, when you think about the word peace right now, you're going, Gilbert, that, that's all fine and good, but you know, I'm probably not going to die today or the next day. I have stuff going on in my life right now. How do I have peace in my life right here, right now, in my current circumstances? Well, Jesus talks about this. Look at John chapter 16, verse 33. Jesus says this, I have taught you all these things so that in me you might have peace. In this world you will have trials and sorrow, but take heart, for I have won the victory over the world. At one point, Jesus says that Satan is the little G-O-D of this world. That for a short time, Satan has control of what's going on right here and right now. And many of you think, cool, Satan's my buddy. No, he's not. Jesus makes it very, very clear that Satan wants to steal from you. He wants to kill you. He wants to destroy you. Satan wants to rob you of all of your peace. So Jesus is saying, look, in this world, you're going to have some trouble. You're going to have some sorrow. It's going to feel like Satan's throwing all kinds of crap at you and that you can't get away from it. But guess what? Jesus says, I have overcome that. Yes, it may seem like Satan has winning a couple battles, but I, long term, I have won the war. So have peace because I have overcome the world. The world has been defeated. So how do you have peace right here and right now? In the presence of Jesus. You have to have a relationship with Jesus and he will give you his peace, a peace which is beyond human comprehension. The last way that Jesus gives us peace is peace from our past. He gives you peace from your past. You know, we've all sinned, right? Is there anybody here that wants to say, oh, no, I, I've never sinned. Anybody online you want to say, oh, I've never sinned? There's a word for people like that. You know what it's called? Yeah, very good, liar. That wasn't very hard to figure out. You're a liar and the truth is not in you is basically what Scripture says about that. We've all sinned. And people are like, I don't really like that word sin. But I've talked about this before. The word sin simply means to miss the mark. You're shooting a bow and arrow or you're shooting at a target with a gun. If you miss the mark, if you don't hit the bullseye, you have sinned. That's what that word means. And we've all done it. We've all missed the mark. None of us have been perfect. And so the, the question then is, well, what are you going to do when you have to stand before a righteous and holy God and give an account for the ways that you've sinned against Him? Because He's the one that's given sort of the law of here, here's what we need to do. Here's what it means to live a moral life, a godly life. How are you going to answer for that? How are you going to give an account for the, the times that you've gone out of bounds sexually? What's going to give you peace when you have to talk to God about that? What's going to give you peace when you have to explain to God every single time you lied, even those little white lies? Or the time that you stole something? What's going to give you peace in that moment? What's going to give you peace when you know, you, you have to give an account for the words that came out of your mouth that you never even in your wildest dreams thought you'd ever say to another human being, but you were so angry in that moment that those words came flying out of your mouth and you hurt your spouse or you hurt your kids or you hurt your coworker or you hurt your friend. What's going to give you peace in that moment? How are you going to account for that? Now, I know some of you are going, well, Gilbert, I'll, I'll just say to God, yes, yeah, sorry about that, but look at all the good stuff I did. I mean, I was a Boy Scout. I, I have little old ladies across the road. And I did all kinds of great things. I served people, and I was generous, and I, I did things. So God, you know, it looks to me like the good outweighs the bad, so you should just like sort of sweep the other stuff under the rug. There's a problem with that, though. You see, God is a perfect God. And the destination we would like to ultimately end up in is heaven, right? Well, heaven is a perfect place. 
So in heaven, you have this perfect God. And what happens is if he lets you and I into his heaven as sinners, as imperfect people, guess what we do? We mess it up. It's no longer perfect anymore. And so you and I can't go to heaven. Why? Because of our, our sinfulness. Even if you've done a, a million good things in your life and only one bad thing ever, one bad thing ever, that still makes you imperfect and you're ineligible for heaven. And this is what Paul's talking about in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, when he says this, everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. What is the standard? What is God's glorious standard? His glorious standard is perfection. You and I must be perfect in order to make it into heaven. Now again, I'll ask the question, is anybody here or anybody online want to make the claim that you have been perfect? So none of us are eligible to, for heaven. So what is our only alternative then? If you can't go to heaven, the only alternative is? You can say it out loud. It's okay. It's not a cuss word. Yeah. In this context, it's not a cuss word. <laughs> yeah, the only alternative is hell. What you and I deserve for our sinfulness is hell. That's the bad news. The good news is found in the very next verse, verse 24. Paul writes, yet God in his grace freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty for our sins. The good news of Christianity is that Jesus was God in the flesh and Jesus lived the perfect and sinless life that you and I could never live. He died on the cross in payment for our sins. And then the proof that he really could forgive our sins, he rose again from the dead. And he said, because of what I did for you on the cross, if you're in my presence, if you have a relationship with me, I will give you my perfection. In other words, when you stand before God to give an account for your life, God is going to see Jesus in you and you in Jesus. All he sees is perfection. Therefore, you're able to make it to heaven. Not because of you, but only because of Jesus and what he did for you. Now your question is, okay, how do I, how do I get this relationship with Jesus? How, how would I even do that? Well, it's very simple. You just ask. You acknowledge that I haven't been perfect. I've been a sinner. And Jesus, I need you to, to come in and lead me and guide me and, and control me and help me from this day forward. Give me your, your spirit so I can live and be more like you. And really, as we return back to the, the story here in John chapter 20 that we began the day with, that's essentially what the disciples do. They, they suddenly come to this realization that he really is God. Here he is. He, he's, he's alive. We, we see the, the nail prints in his hand. We see the wound in his side. And he's telling us to have peace. And it's in that, that moment that the disciples, they truly believe. And we read this then in John 20, 22. And with that, he, meaning Jesus, breathed on them and said what? What did he say? Receive the Holy Spirit. Receive the Holy Spirit. And this is another reason that we can have peace. is because when you truly pray and you ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins and come in and take control of your life, to be the leader of your life, it's in that very moment He gives you His Spirit. The same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead now lives inside of you. No wonder we can have peace. And you know, over this past year, so many people were afraid of getting breathed on and catching a virus, when really the best thing that could ever happen to you in your life is to get breathed on and receive the Holy Spirit. And that's what Jesus wants to do for you today. He wants to breathe His Spirit into you. He wants to give you His peace. He wants to give you forgiveness. He wants to give you His perfection, His righteousness. That's what he wants. He wants to transform you and change you into a brand new person. Now, many of you know that in addition to pastoring here at Exponential, I also have a ministry to professional poker players uh, from all over the world. And through the years, I've been able to, to help many poker players with you know, whatever they're dealing with at the time. And, and they've led quite a few then into a relationship with Jesus. One of the very first, actually, it was the very first poker player I ever led to, to Jesus back in 2013, 14, somewhere around there. 
His name is John, and John has still remained a great friend. But John was living in North Carolina at the time and led him in a relationship with Jesus, and man, just Jesus changed him so much. And John's roommate was a guy by the name of Corey. And Corey is, I don't know, 6'3", 6'4", 6'5", really tall guy, very energetic. I mean, the life of the party type of guy, and a really good person. Now, Corey always gave lip service to God. Oh, yeah, I believe in God, you know, blah, 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 and all that kind of stuff. But you could just tell by his life that he, he really wasn't in a relationship with Jesus. But yet again, Corey was doing all kinds of amazing things. He, he's actually one of the most successful tournament players of all time. And Corey would take a lot of his winnings, and he would like, okay, I'm going to go to a school, and I'm like, just going to like buy the whole school, like everything that they need. So, I mean, a very generous guy but yet not in a relationship with Jesus. In December of 2019, and Corey and I through the years, we had kept in touch with one another. But in 2019, in December, Corey sends me a, a, a private message on Facebook. And actually, he always does voice memos. He hates the type, so it's always a, a voice memo. So I always got to find my earbuds and like put them in and, and uh, hear what Corey's saying. But uh, he asked me a question about the Bible. I was like, well, that's pretty cool. You know, it's been a while since he asked anything spiritual. And so I answered that question. And then like a week or two later, I get some more questions. And then the pandemic hit. And all of a sudden, those questions became every single day. And you could tell that God was just stirring something in his heart. The guy was working and doing something. He was, he was like, Corey was just so hungry for, for God's word and to understand it. And uh, in fact, those questions continue to this day. Yesterday, I got more questions from Corey, right? But something else happened in the midst of the pandemic as Corey is asking all these questions. And so I asked Corey to put together a little video for us here just so you can hear his story from his words and his mouth of the transformation that happened. So take a look at this. Hey, everybody. So my name is Corey Walland, and... I'm a completely different Corey than I was a little over eight months ago. I've been transformed by the renewal of my mind. Uh, Romans 12, 2. And even, even being able to quote a Bible verse like that is crazy because you never would have caught me doing that eight months ago or before. Um, so I'll just uh, start at the beginning of my testimony. When I was 15 years old, I gave my life to God. At least I thought I did. Uh, I saw a Billy Graham crusade on TV and then I got on my knees and I remember I raised my hand with my ma and and I asked Jesus to come into my heart. And now at that point, once you truly give your life to God, you're supposed to start walking up the sanctification line, you know, every day trying to be more and more like Christ. None of us will ever get there to perfection, but we could try to do that. But at that point is when I started walking the opposite way. That's when I started then smoking weed shortly after. Uh, and then that turned into smoking weed all day, every day for the next 20 years of my life. Um, 19 years, we'll say actually, because now I've been clean for, like just before I started this video, I checked, I have this app and eight months and 17 days I've been clean. I've saved over $10,000 and 12 days worth of time. I'm like, wow, <laughs> that's how much weed I used to smoke. Now I'm not proud of it, I'm just saying, that's what I used to do. Now I did drink a lot too. Um, but weed was like my main thing and I was trying to find my peace in weed. You know, I thought that it helped me relax and helped me focus and helped me calm down and help me sleep better and blah, 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 blah. It was all a lie from the devil. So um, I don't think I mentioned, but I've been a professional poker player since 2013. So weed was something that I thought always helped me. Like every single break, I would go out to the car, I would go outside to a break spot, I'd be smoking a joint or I'd have a bowl in my book bag or sometimes even have like a bong in the car. And that's where I tried to find my peace was weed. And I drank a lot too, like I mentioned, because in casinos, it's free. You know, most casinos at least, you just tip them and you get free drinks. I never really realized that I had a drinking problem until after I fully surrendered my life to God. But yeah, alcohol, weed. I used to go to music festivals and stuff too and do molly and mushrooms and all types of stuff. Again, not proud of it. That's just who I used to be. But my mind was transformed and how God has transformed me in eight months is truly, in, like, there's not really any words to even describe it, but it's truly incredible. And how that happened was COVID, all right? I'm not giving the credit to COVID, but during COVID, God took away all my distractions. I couldn't play poker anymore. I uh, couldn't travel anymore. And that's where he really started to work on me. Like, 
the beginning of COVID, I remember someone sent me a video. Uh, we met this family on a cruise and he sent me a video. He's like, Corey, I think you really would enjoy this video. And it was this guy, Larry Morell, that has a Facebook ministry. And in that video, I heard a verse that he said that I'd never heard before. Being raised, going to church, heard, I don't even know how many sermons, never heard this verse before. And it was Matthew 16, 24, where Jesus says, in order to follow me, which is what it means to be a Christian, you know, to be a follower of Christ, you must deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow me. And I'm like, deny yourself, deny yourself. And now in my head, I'm trying to make that mean something else, but I knew what it meant. I, like God went from nudging me to screaming at me, stop smoking weed, Corey, stop smoking weed, Corey. That's what it was. Now I didn't quit right away. I kept smoking, but long story short, after a couple months, I did quit. And <laughs> that verse was a huge, huge part of it. Every time I would go to take a bong rip or roll a joint, I'd be thinking, well, I'm not really denying myself, I'm not really denying myself, and I felt convicted. So then a couple months goes by, or excuse me, it was a month after I had quit smoking, I reached out to Larry on Facebook and I was like, hey man, I've never been baptized before. I just recently quit smoking. I would really love to get baptized. Like, you know, could you do that for me? And he says, sure. He's like, but are you ready to fully surrender your life to God? And I'm like, yes, I, yes, I am. So we ended up scheduling a day and I went up there and on July 11th, 2020, I got baptized and I even asked Larry to hold me underwater a little bit longer to make sure that I was extra clean. You <laughs> know, That's how dirty I felt. And then from that day, there's so many testimonies and stories of things that I could tell you what happened. But side note, if you wanna watch my YouTube channel, I make vlogs on most of the trips that I go uh, because I have a poker following and people who watch my videos for poker, now they're here in ministry and they're seeing how I'm transformed. People that I used to party with, people that I used to smoke with and I used to get last level Long Island is what I would call it. Like in the last level of a poker tournament, I would order Long Island iced teas. There's like five or six shots in that and I'd be down and I'm like, it's my job. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, um, it's, it's truly incredible how the Holy Spirit works. And now I no longer get high on a substance and try to put my peace in a substance. I put, or I mean, I get my peace from God because he will give you a peace that surpasses all understanding. And there is no high like the most high. I'm gonna say that again for the people in the back. There is no high like the most high. Every single day, it is truly incredible how God uses me. And when he uses me these ways, I'm just like, I. It literally brings tears to my eyes because every day I ask him, God, please help me make up for lost time and please guide my steps and use my tongue how you want to use it. Not how I want to, how you want to use it. And when you ask God to use you, he will use you. That's for sure. And, you know, if you had asked me eight months ago or before, Corey, what's your goal in life? I would have said something along the lines of I want to win as many poker tournaments as I can. I want to be the Michael Jordan of poker, something like that. Right now you ask me. My goal in life is to win as many souls as I can for the kingdom. Now I can't save anybody, only Jesus Christ can do that, but I could use the way that God made me and I don't have a wife, I don't have any kids, so I've been out doing street ministry in various cities all over the country. I go to these Christian revivals and I invite people that I used to party with to come and granted not many of them have came, but I know a lot of them see my Facebook videos or the videos I put on my YouTube channel or the posts that I put up and they're like, man, that dude was wild and now look at him. Wait, he's talking about God all the time? You know, cause in the poker world, I'm known as Mr. Think Bank or Corey Banks is my nickname cause I started a brand all about spreading positivity. So people always said that I was a great person and that they had so much fun around me and how are you so happy all the time? And anytime someone asks me that, I would usually give the answer, oh, my mom raised me well, instead of using that as an opportunity to give them the reason for the hope that we have. And that was something that, again, I've always believed in God. I've always went to church, but it's different to think it with your head and to say you're a Christian than to actually live a Christian life and to have a complete heart change, you know, a, a repentant heart, not just saying sorry and apologizing for and then going right back to doing what you're doing. No, no, no. Repenting is to turn away from sin. You were living in the world. Now you're living for God because it's impossible to hold hands with the world and still walk with Jesus. And that's what I was trying to do. I was holding hands with everything that I was doing, but oh, I believe in God. I went to church on Sundays. It doesn't work like that. All right? It can't work like that. His power is made perfect in our weakest. And like when we surrender to him and to his will in our life, like when I used to pray, I used to be, oh God, please let me get good hands. Please let me win this poker tournament. No, no, no. Now my prayer is God, let your will be done. Let your will be done. And story after story, I could tell you of some tournaments that I played recently that I bust out and I'm like in my own head about busting. I'm very like hard on myself and very competitive. And then something happens that's just, whoa, I didn't see that coming. And that's the kind of things that God has been doing through me because I surrender to his will and I do what God wants, not what I want. Um, 
So there's a lot that I could say here. Gilbert wanted me to keep this five minutes. Sorry, Gilbert, I'm almost at eight minutes. But guys, just let God use you. And don't put your, your faith into a substance to give you that peace because the peace that surpasses all understanding is in Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross for us. All right, so I'm just gonna leave that there. <laughs> I love you guys. Everybody who's watching this video, I love you. But way, way, way more than me, God loves you and he wants the best for you and he has a plan for your life no matter where you are no matter what your job is you might not be able to go all over the country and preach the gospel but you could do it at your job you can do it through facebook you can do it at the grocery store you can stop and say a prayer with the homeless person you see on the corner we can all do our part all right all of us so again i love you guys uh god bless and think bank Corey was trying to find his peace and pot and drugs and becoming the Michael Jordan of poker. And you're going, well, that's not my issue. Well, it probably isn't. But the point I've been trying to make here today is that we all find cheap substitutes of what we think is going to give us peace instead of getting the true and lasting peace that Jesus offers us. So that's what today's message is really all about. How do you get the type of peace? How do you get the type of transformation like you just saw that happened in Corey's life? And again, I hope we can actually have him come here and live talk to you and share some of the stories at some point of just everything he's been able to do over these past couple months, just traveling around and he'll call me or he'll tell me things about, you know, oh, I was on the street, you know, and I just met this homeless person and, you know, and we were all standing there and all of a sudden, you know, we're holding hands and there's like 40 homeless people. We're all like, you know, praying together. And so, I mean, just some truly amazing things that's been happening as he's been going out. And that may not be your thing. Maybe you can't travel like Corey does, but like he said, you can make a difference. So it's not about just getting God's peace. It's then about spreading God's peace to others. So how do we get it? Well, that was the question many people 50 days after Jesus' resurrection had. A big crowd had gathered. And so Peter, he stands up because they're going, well, what, was, what must we do to be saved like you guys? And Peter's like, uh, somebody want to preach a message? Nobody? Nobody? And Peter's like, okay, I'm up then. And Peter preaches the very first sermon in this new thing called the church. And here's part of what he says, Acts 2, 38. Peter replied, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So what do you need to do? You need to ask for forgiveness. You need to repent of your sins. Corey talked about that in there. That it just simply means to turn from your sins and then you need to be baptized. Now, baptism doesn't save you, but baptism is symbolic to others of the decision that you've made. Now, I began today by sharing with you that like the most quoted or the most highlighted thing ever on Kindle is the quote from Suzanne Collins that sometimes things happen to people and they're not equipped to deal with it. Today I've talked to you about how to be equipped to deal with the things in your life, with the past, with the present, and with the future. You are now equipped to have peace in your life. You can have it. It can truly be yours. Now, Kendo also tracks all the highlights in the Bible as well. What do you think is the most highlighted verse in Scripture? Go ahead and shout it out online. You can type in. What do you think is the most highlighted verse that people have? Go ahead and shout something out. Yeah, that's what I figured most of you would say. John 3.16. And that would be very apropos for today's message, right? That for God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Again, great verse. Very appropriate for today. But actually, the most highlighted verse on Kindle is Philippians 4, 6-7. Here's what it says. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all that He has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything you can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. That's the type of peace that God wants for you today. And it's only a prayer way. So join me in prayer. Father, thank you so much for this day and all that it signifies that you, God, lived a perfect and sinless life and you died in our place and you rose again from the dead so that we may be forgiven. And so Lord, if there's anybody here or anybody that's online that has not yet started a relationship with you, I just pray 
that right now, in humility, they would just acknowledge to you that I'm a sinner and I need your forgiveness. I need your peace. And so, Jesus, I'm turning from my sin in many of the same ways that we saw that, that Corey didn't just pray a prayer so he could, he could have a get out of hell free card. No, he prayed that prayer and he said, now God, transform me. So I'm turning from my sins. I'm getting rid of the old life and I'm going to start a brand new life. God, that's what you want for all of us, to turn from our sin and turn fully to you. So Lord, if there's anybody here that has not yet made that decision or anybody that's watching online, either live with us or maybe a recording in the future that are watching this back, Lord, help them just to, again, acknowledge their sin, ask for your forgiveness, and, and, and ask for your Holy Spirit to help them then to turn from their sin and have a brand new life. Jesus, we thank you. We thank you that you do that for us. And it's a gift. We don't earn that gift. We don't deserve that gift. It is just a gift to help us reach out and take it. Now, with every head bowed, every eye closed, if you have never prayed that prayer before, you've never asked him for his forgiveness, you've never asked him for his leadership and for the Spirit to come in to, to lead you and guide you, I'm going to ask you on the, the count of three right now, if you're live with us here, you're just going to raise your hand. Online, there's going to be a, a little button that's going to be there in the chat for you. You can just pop it and push that. It says, I'm going to raise my hand and, and ask Jesus to forgive me. We would just like to know who you are and, and acknowledge that. Again, every head bowed and every eye closed here in the room, so nobody will know that you've made that decision here. And online, obviously, nobody's going to know that you pushed that button either. But on the count of three, just let us know the decision you made. Ready? One, two, three. Yes, Jesus, please come into my life. Raise your hand up high. Yes, Jesus, I need your forgiveness. Okay, I see a hand over here. I see a hand back there. Thank you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Come into my life. Be the leader of my life. Online, push that button that you're now accepting this, this moment of salvation for yourself. Anyone else? I'm just going to ask everybody just to sort of pray this prayer with me. Dear Jesus, thank you for coming to this earth living a perfect and sinless life, dying on the cross so my sins may be forgiven. I want your peace. And so right now, I acknowledge my sinfulness and I'm going to turn from my sinfulness and give full control of my life to you. Send your Spirit to live inside of me to lead me, to guide me, to direct me all the days of my life. It's not about me. It's now all about you. Jesus, again, thank you that we have people here in the room that acknowledge they were praying that for the first time. I'm sure we have people online as well. Thank you. You said that there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over even just one sinner who repents, much less multiple people that are turning from their sin and turning towards you and are receiving your peace in your spirit right now. So we can't thank you enough for that. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, can we give those that made a decision here today to follow Jesus? Big hand. Congratulations to you. For those of you that are in the room here, we need you to go to exponential.church and you're going to be able to find a little guide that we put together there. It's called Launch and it's a 19-page guide that I wrote a couple years ago on how to start this relationship with Jesus now and continue your relationship with Jesus. I say this all the time, that when somebody gets married, saying I do doesn't mean I'm done, right? That's just the beginning of that marriage relationship. And what you basically just did is you said, I do to Jesus, that I want to have a relationship with you. And so now you got to work on that relationship. And so that, that little booklet is going to help you. So again, for those of you live in the room, you can go online and get a copy of that. Those of you that are there in the chat, you're able to get it right there. There's a link. Uh, for that. And again, it's going to walk you through how to read your Bible, why to pray, why to become a part of a church, all kinds of things like that, just to help you in your new journey with Jesus. So again, congratulations to those who made that decision.